success. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah, let's see if I can make this a little louder. Um, for anyone jumping in now, we're going to be talking um, about manipulations, joint alignment, mobility. I'm kind of all things joints for a little bit here. Um, I guess, I don't know if we should give people a couple minutes to join or just start. Um, do you want to give maybe just a quick introduction to anyone who maybe doesn't know you? Sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Carrie Sconey. I am a uh, certified sports chiropractor. I practice outside of Chicago and I specialize in treating dancers. So I see mostly pre-professional and I've been doing that for 14 years and my passion like yours is keeping dancers healthy. So, um, so yeah, I'm kind of in an unconventional route because I went the chiropractic route and there's a lot of dance medicine practitioners who do PT and a lot of us who come from a chiropractic background. So I suppose that's a little I actually never thought about that. I'm trying to think right now out of all the people I interact with on Instagram, I can't think, I don't think I can think of another chiropractor. Yeah. I know a handful that are kind of scattered about Canada and the U S but, um, not many of us. Well, it's great. Um, I think we're all lucky to have you in this space. Um, uh, Maybe I'll just do a quick introduction if anyone sees this who's coming from your side. Um, So my name's Scott. I'm a doctor of physical therapy. I guess my non-traditional is that I come from not a dance background. I come from a sports background, sports therapy, personal training, collegiate training. Um, And then I got engaged to a professional dancer. And as I helped her, then I helped a few of her friends, I started learning there's a lot we can do here. And that was probably four years ago where I started saying, okay, it's time to start digging in, Mm -hmm. um, learning from other great people like you, Carrie, and um, then putting my own little touch on it, trying to take, combine this cross-training injury prevention that I think we've studied a lot in sport and apply that to to artistic athletes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I love what you do. Thank you, and I love what you do. So... We will try to jump right into this topic. If anyone's joining and has any questions, anything, joint manipulations, joint stability, joint mobility, um, what are those sounds, uh, cracking, popping, that's things we're going to be covering, and we're, we're happy to take some questions as they come up. Um, okay, so kind of the best place to start, I guess, is what are those sounds we hear when maybe you go to a chiropractor or you pop your your knuckles. Can you explain what's actually going on? Yeah, yeah, I could try. Um, So joints have fluid that make them move. It's called synovial fluid, and there's a a capsule around the joint, and so uh, there's little gas bubbles inside that fluid, and so when a joint moves to kind of its end range of motion, sometimes that there's a... change in pressure in that fluid and then the gas bubbles are actually just released because of the change of pressure and that's the popping sound you hear. I liken it sometimes to like if you have two glass plates like wet glass plates and you stick them together and you try to pull them apart and there's some there's some tension there but when you finally pull them apart sometimes you'll get like a popping sound and that's what happens in joints. I haven't heard that analogy before that's good. Okay so we have fluid filled around our joint. Uh-huh. Air, air bubbles get created, or, or I think carbon dioxide is the main. Uh-huh. Um, and then they pop. So before we jump into, uh-huh. before we go too deep, I guess the important thing is, do we need that? Um, or is that air bubble release good for the body? Is it bad for the body? Is it? Right. It's, it's neither. It's neither. It's pretty indifferent. Um, I think a lot of times in chiropractic, uh, people associate like that popping sound with a a positive effect. And there, there is positive effect to having joints manipulated and moved, but it really has no relation to if there's a sound or not. Um, I've had some patients that like, if I've manipulated a joint and they don't hear a sound, like, oh, you didn't get it. And that's not really true because it's not, it's not about the sound. The sound is just kind of an ancillary that happens sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. But, um, a lot of times patients feel like 
a correlation. You're like, oh, I feel yeah. better. I heard a sound that must be related. Um, yeah. And I think for, for the patient, for the dancers who might be watching this thinking you're want that sound. But I think it also comes into that in school, in courses, we want the sound. You know, I can think back to yeah. classes where we learn manipulations and you'd like go just like the easiest place, like the upper back, you know, and you'd be like, oh, it didn't crack. Let me go again. Right. And I think, so we get in the mindset where that like means something happened. But what you're saying is the sounds don't correlate which, with the other benefits. Right. Are they, they aren't needed for the other benefits. Right, exactly. So you can have one without the other. So, I mean, a lot of times you when you get to an end range, it's common to have a popping sound. And so sometimes our goal is to restore that end range of motion. And that's why they commonly happen together. But you can restore motion without having a popping sound. And you can have a popping sound without having necessarily a benefit. Yeah. And so we have a question here. Clay asks, I heard it was nitrogen gas being released. Is that incorrect? And I'd say, I well, you can answer remember. that. I don't actually remember. Yeah. There's like I, I think nitrogen is involved, but it's multiple gases. Yeah. I don't think it's one thing. I think CO2 is actually in there. But um, to, to dig on that question a little bit more, Clay, is that release is not the benefit anyone is seeking for or, or shouldn't be seeking for at least right. because – it's not the gas that does anything. The gas isn't yeah. doing anything. It's not, you know, the releasing of that gas doesn't have any other kind of chemical, like, neurobiologic effect that's happening. Yeah. There are things and, that happen in that area, but it's not because of gas. Yeah, and these bubbles come and go. Like, they're not a static thing, like a bubble developed. Oh, no, I have a bubble. I need to get rid of it. They come as you're moving. They release on their own without sound. They, they develop through joint movement. So um, that particular gas might be one of the gases. I think it's part of it, um, but no relation. So, and please ask any follow-up questions if you need. But let's take that to the next step then, Carrie. If we are, that's what the sound is, and that doesn't need it, isn't needed for the benefit. Can we go to, I don't know, should we start at what are the benefits first or talk about what is needed for the benefits? Yeah, sure. Let's talk about, let's talk about benefits. Um, the proposed benefits of manipulating a joint is to restore motion. That's what I'm looking for when I'm working with a dancer or any patient is we're looking for, like, joints are supposed to have certain amounts of range of motion, albeit it's very small. Um, and therapists like you and I have trained a long time to try to feel like joints movement, what we call like a soft end feel or a hard end feel. And uh, we can compare different joints to see how they move. Um, and so when I'm working with a, with a patient, I'm looking to see like are there segments of the spine or elsewhere that just aren't moving in that physiological normal range? And if that's true, can we restore any of that motion? For instance, in a dancer, um, I see this sometimes in the talus bone, which is in the ankle. And, and sometimes dancers need some help getting that bone to glide backwards when they plie, especially dancers who dance on point. Uh, there's a lot of forward motion in the ankle, and sometimes they just need some help gliding that bone backwards. Maybe it's because they have, you know, it could be for a lot of different reasons, but yeah. um, I won't go into that. But um, one, so one main benefit is, is to try to restore motion where it might be lost. And so... We do, we do that. Uh, there is There are some other benefits. Um, there's some reflex-like responses that happen to the nerves in the area, and it, it increases signals to the brain. There's a chemical effect that reduces pain. Uh, there's, really a, there's a lot of research going on right now about um, how uh, manipulation to the spine actually stimulates the multifidus muscle. I don't know if you've seen that. Have you seen that? Um, and that they see that, that you can actually stimulate the multifidus muscle uh, to fire and maybe to increase its activity um, following joint manipulation, which is really important because we know people who have low back pain have really poor multifidus action, which is a stabilizing yeah. muscle in the spine. But, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, no, uh, you're... so those are some of the benefits. So... But the main thing that we're looking for is to make sure, are the joints moving? 
Yeah. Okay. So to summarize, we had a few things and I think I want to touch and then we'll get to your question, Jay. Um, first you started, one of the main things you're looking for is, is a joint moving appropriately? And, and can you add motion? And you mentioned an ankle, an ankle one. And this is one I actually, I think I self prescribe for with like a band. They can do a little bit on their own. In that one, in most cases, you're probably not getting a sound. Am I correct? I get, a, I get sound. You, you might, okay. Yeah, you're probably <laughs> no, manipulating. No, no, no. I do a lot of like gentle matter. glides there. It doesn't there. matter. What, you know, that doesn't, it doesn't matter because it's the same thing. Yeah. Um, Which I wasn't trying to yes. say. That I just, that's one for me. I like never, ever get a sound. Yeah. Um, a dancer but my patient their, still. A dancer wouldn't on their own typically because yeah. it's a really kind of awkward motion. Um, but again, the sound doesn't matter, but... You know, there's a difference, too, between mobilizing and, like, a high-velocity thrust on it, too. Like, can we yeah. get more motion when we thrust on it versus self-mobilize? But um, Cool. Well, so let me – so we have one, joint mobility. And then you mentioned a few that are pretty complex that we probably don't need to run down. But there's some things on a neurological, meaning a sensation, just how, it, how your nerves respond. Yeah. And then you mentioned there's a chemical response that might happen. And from my side of it, and you might have, I, I'm not a heavy manipulator. Um, some of that stuff is, it, it might be different who that who gets different feelings, right? So for some of these ways, maybe you're getting this kind of one, maybe you're getting this. We don't really know, but if it helps, it helps. Would you say that's partly accurate? Yeah, I mean, I think there's still a lot. Are getting studying. all of them? There's a lot of studying going on still about are these are those type of effects short term or long term? Um, yeah. You know, we get a chemical effect that's you maybe get some endorphins that you feel a release um, or or a reduction in pain. Does yeah. it translate to anything long term? You know, the jury's still out on that. We don't really yeah. see long term. Okay, this is good. That's kind of a good segue because so we've talked about um so far what is the popping sound what is some of the benefits of actually getting there manipulating mobility and some of these other pain release things and then we say but do we know does that make long-term change and i think this segues kind of nicely for our population dancers who are getting these manipulations they feel better and maybe their pain is coming back and i would say if they're getting that, what would you say the next piece in the puzzle is? And, and I know this is specific, but in general, what goes yeah. beyond? Is that was that a clear question? I think so. Um, let me try to answer, <laughs> and then you can clarify if you need to. But um, you know, in in my practice, joint manipulation is just one tool. Like a lot of yeah. therapists use, there's a lot of tools, and sometimes someone needs that, and sometimes they don't. But it's you know, one one method doesn't usually stand alone. Yeah. It, it works in a group of things. So, for instance, if, if I have a patient who needs, could benefit from some restored motion in a joint, we may do that, but that's not all we do. Then we follow up with muscle activation and uh, retraining motor control and stabilization, and we're trying to get, we're trying to retrain them to work all yeah. around that. Um, so it's not really... Yeah. Meant to be a standalone so the, procedure. The way I would almost think of this is if, and, and this will segue again, I'm jumping ahead, but so if you feel like you need and you feel relief from getting manipulated, you get that cracking, you get someone trying to do um, a manipulation, which I think many would maybe call it an adjustment or something like that, that, that that's step one. But then the step is maybe finding why was that area right needing more motion and address the things that cause that or prevent it from happening again. Yep, exactly. Okay, and then I guess to kind of follow up with this, Jay had a question I think might lead us in there. Let me see if I can find your... Jay said, I want to... He asked, I should ask this question. What is happening when your hip pops? Is it the joints rubbing together? Um, and I think this could lead into... We talked about the cracking from... A therapeutic standpoint, mm -hmm. maybe you can answer his question and then go into what are some of the other popping sounds um, people might feel. Yeah, so different joints have, have different sounds coming from them. Um, 
in the spine, the sound that we normally hear is a gapping in the joints. In the hip, we often hear a snapping tendon is the most common sound in dancers. It's really common. Uh, so your hip flexor tendons will slide over the, the bony part of your um, hip joint and can make a really loud popping sound. And so that's probably most common. You can get some noise from inside of the hip joint through there, but it's probably less common than a snapping yeah. tendon. So if we if we had to really generalize for a large proportion of dancers, a snapping hip is coming from a tendon that's... Yeah. And this is, and I know I, I can see it in you, and it's me trying to, like, it's a pretty complex topic, and there really is a lot of different things that could be going on with joint sounds and with, especially with people who've had injuries or more complex. Um, so just for anyone watching and for us, we are... I know both trying to balance how far do I want to go down a topic. I mean, it's something that, like I said, I'm probably not an expert in this area either. So it's interesting for me. Um, but yeah, going to this question, I guess you're to summarize, we have the popping in the hip. And if it's coming with movement, um, especially active movement, like you're m using your muscles and you're hearing that popping, it's, I would agree. It's probably actually the tendons, which connect your muscle to bone, that are popping over bony things. Uh -huh. Now you mentioned, and sometimes you might even be able to feel that, like a, as it pops, something bump, and that's a pretty good sign that your tendon's moving. Yeah. You mentioned that there is inside the joint, and I would say, it's hard, I want to be like, where do you feel it? Because that could help it, but yeah, that might be a sign of one, a pathology, like something going wrong, yeah. but then it also can be normal, right? That yeah. sometimes your joints have, yeah. um, yeah. one of the things I, I, I see that a lot in therapy when I'm treating someone, I see a lot, maybe in shoulders, every time they reach overhead, they hear pop, pop, pop. Mm -hmm. The first thing I always ask is, does it hurt when you do that? Yeah. And it's like, no, it just makes sound. My response is usually like, let's not worry about it. We're working on your shoulder already. Our goal is not to make that sound go away, right. Right. but it probably will as we improve how you're moving. Do you have similar Thanks. cases where people have sounds? And yeah, yeah, same. I think the shoulder and the hip we can compare a lot, like shoulder in general population or other athletes and hips and dancers, um, yeah. because uh, labral, labral tears are pretty common in both, yeah. and uh, the labral cartilage, you know, just creates some suction in that joint and holds that in place, and so uh, you can get a little, like, micro instability or in the joint, almost, and so you can hear some noise when that moves around, and it doesn't necessarily mean a bad, it's a bad thing, because you can function really well with torn yeah. labrums in the shoulder, in the hip, the question is, how do you move? You know, how, how yeah. well do you move? How efficient do you move? Are you strong? Can that joint stabilize? You know, can you coordinate your movement in that joint? And so, I, you know, sometimes I have dancers who come in and say, oh, the orthopedist says I have a labral tear in my hip and I need surgery. And I, you know, that... I just let that go because that doesn't matter to me. That structural part doesn't matter that much to me unless you have impeccable function. If you are really strong, you really move well through that joint, and you have, and then you still have pain or it's still really limiting you, then maybe I care. But it's really more about yeah. how you move through there. Yeah, and that this is going your muscle, to your muscles. You know how strong you yeah. are and how you stabilize. So our advice on that, and then I'm gonna add. Um, if you hear popping is don't let the sound dictate what's going on it's really how you feel and how you're moving if you feel like everything is a sound you can't move your arm a certain direction or your hip gets stuck we definitely need to address it if it's just making some sound yep how about this this is a good question for you. if it's just making sound um and no pain would you should they seek advice or should they not worry about it so if I'm, if I'm seeing a dancer, definitely I, my, my criteria, if someone is not a patient, is when it starts to hurt, come in and we'll look at it. Okay. Or if it starts to, if it doesn't hurt, but it's affecting your dancing or your sport or whatever, come in and let's figure, figure it out. Because it's starting, then it's starting to have um, a functional role in what yeah. you're doing. Um, now, if I'm working with a dancer on something else and I do kind of a full system check and I, and I see that the hip pops and I, and I ask, um, I may investigate a little bit further and try to figure out why and if it's something we need to work on preemptively. Like if I yeah. see a lot of like, oh, 
we need some core stabilization and we need some hip strength, then we'll address that kind of preemptively so it doesn't get sore and we can fix it off the bat. Yeah. But in general, my rule is like, if you hear a popping, um, one, try not to worry about it. Um, two, yeah. try not to, you know, assume it's something bad. And um, three, if it starts to hurt, then come in. Good. And that's kind of, I think, similar advice, I would say. If it's hurting you or affecting, as you said a few times, movement, if you can't move when it pops, something changes about your movement, it's probably worth getting checked out. Yeah. Um, but that if it's a new sound starting, it might be something worth, if maybe your hip starts popping, being, hey, have I been paying attention to my hips? Maybe there's, I wouldn't say sounds defecate, definitely mean there is an issue, but it could potentially be an early warning sign. Would you agree? Yes. So maybe that's some self-care. Like, hey, I'm going to try to, what was I doing before that I'm not doing now? You know, so if it's foam rolling, if it's doing some glute work, if it's combining that, if it's some balance, yeah. that might help. Yeah. Um, but the sound rule is never my goal. So we have a few other questions. Let's see here. Um Clay is back. Okay, and I think this is where we'll jump into next. Let me just see this other question before I get to that, Clay. Okay, maybe we'll go here before we get to your question. Clay's question was about um, self-manipulation. What's our opinion on that? Um, then he knows their, their fingers, their neck. Is it okay to do that daily? So we'll get there, but then we have another question here from Ryan who says, I had a neck injury. While exercising, MRI said I lost some of the natural curve in my neck. Any tips on what I can do to allow the natural curve again? Um, and, and I will say personally, when you're dealing with the spine, it's very complex. So um, that's a tough one. So if Carrie can give some answers, I'll be, I'll be happy because I don't know how much I could say there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so without getting too complex... On that, um, they're, they're, a, like a well-trained therapist is going to be able to help you decide, you know, what you need specifically. So it's unique for every patient. So I'm just going to say that, like, you know, I don't want to give medical advice to someone that doesn't, you know, I haven't evaluated. But, yeah. you know, straightening of the spine, loss of that curve is pretty common um, in athletes. It can happen after injury. You know, there's some theory that after injury, it has a lot to do with muscle spasm in the neck um, or some change in motion that um, changes how we, how we move. And so over time, we get maybe a little bit more stiff through there that we, we lose some of that natural curve. Um in dancers, we see we tend to see some straightening of the spine because of you know the rigidity and the nature of our posture is to to really exaggerate that straightened position. Um, and so things that we do, like I utilize um, strengthening in the muscles, so we'll work on some of the extensor strength. We work on deep neck flexor strengthening, which helps stabilize see the spine through here. Uh, I have patients lay over like a towel roll at night or like a contour. Um, I use... Like, to give like a prolonged kind of like yeah. get that mobility. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, gen but gentle, you know, like I, so, I know some practitioners do like, you know, weighted traction like over the edge of a table i don't utilize that i'm sure some people get results with that but i don't like what it does to the ligaments um yeah. i think we're, we're better off like encouraging a really natural curve as opposed to forcing an exaggerated one and so um you know sleeping in a posture that stimulates some of that natural curve because you spend a lot of time in that position um and yeah. then supporting that with the strengthening component and the rehab uh, and, and that can definitely change. That is, yeah. um, and something I thought of as, as we were talking, I'm like, the thing to note is that an MRI that shows a neck yeah. position is a isolated point in time. Static picture. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say that's probably it kind of going back to what we talked about. I'd first say, does it affect you? Do you have any problem with your neck currently? If you just think your neck is stiff because of the MRI, but you feel fine. I would say don't worry about the MRI. Yeah, um, I would. I would argue. I, I just think we can see more. Like as a with a trained eye, like you and I could in yeah. in trained physicians could see more functionally how they're moving and sitting in the office, and that probably matters more. Like I do think I do 
know that there there can be some detrimental effects of reversal of the curve or loss of that curve because of the yeah. way that force distributes through the joints and perhaps increased risk for, for bony change at the joint and arthritis. So there is some significance to that, but you're right. Like an MRI is one picture in a moment of time that like could have been, you could have how you're laying been stiff that day. Yeah, that how day. you were. Like you're, it's yeah. more likely that we can figure out what's going on by watching you move and watching you sit and what are your daily habits and how do you sleep and how do you study and yeah. are you on your you know phone like this yeah all day long and those things matter way more than a straight line on an mri just an image yeah. but then i think you gave if you are feeling really stiff you did some really like nice gentle things i like the towel but like a small towel roll just to give you a tiny bit of curve mm -hmm. so we're not forcing it shouldn't be uncomfortable but it should be like a little yeah almost like a lumbar yeah. support but a, a neck yeah. support just yeah. to give you a little curvature cool okay Ryan, if you have any other questions, follow up on that. We'll be happy to go there. And then Clay's question, I think we will um, we'll go to the next step where he said, what about the people who are constantly cracking their joints? And I'd say, I would say mine. I'm curious what you see. The number one I see for dancers is like the posterior hip, where I think they're probably getting a lot of SI, maybe in the, the actual hip joint. But is that what you see the most? Or what would you, you say? a lot of that. It tends to... Um, I, could, I tend to see more like clumps of like, I crack my joints or I don't. And so if you uh, okay. fall into this camp, it tends to be like crack, crack, everything, you know, Everywhere. Steam every which way. And so they kind of get as much as they can. They pop their hips, they pop their toes or the people who don't. And so I tend to see yeah. more, more of that. Um, okay. But yeah, to that point on self-manipulating, um, you know, the movement itself is not necessarily bad. Obviously, like we do, we do movement. We, I, I like motion as a chiropractor. I, I like to get that movement in the joint. But, but the problem is when you do it yourself is it's not targeted. We're not targeting a specific joint. You know, when I'm when when I'm looking for that, I'm looking for joints that actually need motion. And then I'm applying like a really specified force through that area to try to get motion there. And then I can double check and then I can use our other procedures yeah. afterwards to, to help that. When someone does it on their own, it's very nonspecific. It's pretty much just like an unzipping of like, you know, twist to my yeah. cracks, like the cracks. And yeah. what happens over time is it tends to promote hypermobility. Um, the joints are meant to have a level of stability to them. They're protected by ligaments that hold bones together. Um, and those ligaments protect us and tell us how far we can move. And if some, I've seen dancers become pretty forceful with those motions and they're just so desperate to get a pop, they'll just push into any position to get it. And we really have to think physiologically what that's doing at the joint. And so it can create irritation at the joint capsule. It can create, you know, kind of a hypersensitivity in that area, which can lead to pain. It can stretch those ligaments, which changes like our, how we perceive our body in space. And so my experience is then once you start popping a joint, it feels good. You get an immediate effect to that, albeit usually short term for most people. Um, when they're doing it themselves, especially, yeah. um, then they kind of desire that again. Like, oh, I need that again. That felt yeah. good. I must need that again. Um, and so they do it again. <laughs> and then yeah. what used to be and like, oh, it happened once on accident. Then it becomes like, oh, now I do it every day before class. Or then it becomes, well, I need to do it every day between every class. And then sometimes I'll have a patient sitting in the office right in front of me and tr like cra try to crack their neck like three times in an hour. Um, yeah. So so there is there is some risk. One, it's not specific, so you can do damage. You can be moving joints that don't need motion, which is not helpful. It's creating hypermobility. Two, you can do some structural damage to some of the soft tissues. Um, three, it can become a bit addictive because of the chemical effect of it, and so you just kind of long for that without really knowing if you're having any long-term benefit to it. Um, and the other thing, like, the spine is a little bit different than our other joints. The spine has some pretty sensitive structures in it. So we have our nerve roots yeah. that come out from the spinal canal. We have intervertebral discs that um, can be really sensitive. So that's a little bit of a different, a different beast that I don't like. 
I don't like people to be self manipulating. Yeah. And it, it, there, you know, there's risk. There's definite risk when someone's doing it on their own, untrained. And and I feel like one thing that that I see is that and you mentioned is that I think it's almost like a self fulfilling prophecy. Whereas like you mentioned that oh, you can get a short term relief, but there's risk for future injury and irritation, which I think. We probably see more on the, the back end when they're now coming in for pain. Like, I get stuck and I have to crack it. Yeah. And it's maybe like the chicken or the egg thing. Yeah. Like, well, maybe one thing happened and you, you moved wrong and then you cracked it, but you liked it. So then you started cracking it every day. Yeah. You and think now you're coming to me. Like, oh, it must be good. It's helping me. It must yeah. be good. But I will, tell, I will tell you, Scott, almost inevitably, um, the people who go down that path, almost always end up in one of our offices with pain yeah. because they they tend to lack strength and stability and that routinely leads to pain. Um, yeah. the muscles can go into spasm to try to protect, um, you know, and so I think it's clear when someone comes in the office and says that, like, oh, I need to pop my back to, like, make it feel better, then we do, like, hard stop, like, we got to yeah. talk about this. And, and so Clay mentioned, he's like, yeah, I love that explanation from you. And he said, manipulation with a purpose. And I think when we talk about daily, too, we would never for three years manipulate someone every single day. Right. Because that can help. So we're using, like, like you said, is for a purpose. And then after you address that purpose, let me follow up with a few steps to, to help control that joint, to get more stability or some um, techniques they can do to help loosen it up in different ways. Right. Uh, and my advice typically, so I, I, I go through phases where I try to, I stop trying to make people crack. I'm like, whatever, I'm focusing on other things. And then I go through like, I'm going to try to like work with you and be like, you're going to, I'm going to help you stop this. Yeah. We're going to work. And so a hit or miss, but the thing I say at first is when you get that feeling, like stop for a second and try to actually feel what's going on. So for the hip, for instance, if they need to pop the hip, I'll sometimes say like, can you like go into, um, like just like a seated hamstring stretch or like move out to the side a little bit and, and see, can you feel that spot and can you stretch? And I've had a few that if they go into like a gentle stretch for like 30 seconds, that feeling's gone. Mm -hmm. But yet I didn't overstretch the, the ligaments. Yeah. Do you have any other Well, I, I actually tips? do the opposite. Well, first, I t for people who tell me they self-manipulate a lot, I do cold turkey stop. I have no nice. exceptions to that. It's a stop. Um... They stay under my care. If they need some motion someplace else, like oftentimes, like, for instance, if they are cracking their own back, their low back, they may need motion in their upper back. And yeah. that's, you know, they're hypermobile in the low back, but maybe need some motion up high in the thoracic spine. Um, so we'll address that. But cold turkey stuff on self-manipulating, and then we work on strength and stability. And yeah. so I don't. I will do the same thing that you do, except I have them do an exercise. We activate the muscle yeah. instead of stretch it. Um, Which is so that's been my experience, is, and I tell them good. at home when you get the urge, stop and do the exercise I gave you. And and we've we've talked before, but I know so if someone has the issue where they feel like they constantly have to crack something, what's your go-to advice for anyone watching who feels like I have to crack all the time? Uh, they need strength and stability. So um, and. I, and see someone probably, yeah, right? Yes. That's one thing, yeah. Yeah, so I tell As, uh, stop, um, and if they're not sure how to, you know, if they're not really educated about what they might need, then see someone. See, see a physical therapist or a chiropractor or, you know, um, someone yeah. who can prescribe really specific exercises for you to address that. Um, and then I think, and I wonder what your opinion is. Um, whoop, I'm typing, I didn't mean to do that. In, um, we talked about kind of immediate risk to uh, self-manipulating. I guess long-term, have you read anything? I get asked a lot, like, does that cause arthritis? Have you, do you have an opinion on that? If there's a risk there or not, or what are some long-term risks? Uh, I, I, I can't say definitively, and I think there's still, you know, I think, still think we need to study this a lot more. Yeah. And I think, like anything, there's probably a, a bit of a bell curve as far as, like, you know, too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Um, Really, from my my understanding is lack of motion is a larger contributor to arthritic yeah. joints than motion. Um, that doesn't mean excessive motion is protective for the joints. Yeah. Um, there's some like you know happy medium in here where we want to have motion, but just 
the right amount. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I think they, that, you know, from an arthritic standpoint, I don't use that like, because yeah. I don't think that's sol that's solid. That um, repetitive motion leads to arthritis. It tends to be the opposite. Lack of motion leads to arthritis, which is one argument for why we like to keep joints moving. If we can see there's something in the uh, kinetic chain that isn't moving, we want that to move so that there's less stress on that joint. Um, but yeah, too much can be. Yeah, and I, I've never read anything. I tell them when they ask that. I say I don't think anyone's ever tried ever proved that'd be a very hard study if you guys know how we do science like to really prove it we'd have to take like a thousand people and crack their joints every day for the rest of their life and then see how many of them get arthritis yeah and we can't do that so i've never seen that but i think the one thing you touch on is usually what i say is there's potentially a risk that we are loosening up your joint yeah. um actually in our population and dancers and this is for people who are doing it themselves every day for years mm -hmm. um right not like a skill but that you are potentially loosening up things that shouldn't be loose mm -hmm. and you might not be achieving the goal you think you're trying to achieve so mm -hmm. like you i think we're both agreeing if well you're saying cold turkey if you're out there and you're cracking your joints over and over without someone skilled guiding you stop mm -hmm. yeah all right hard stance yep. I take, um, take a hard stance you know the other thing too is like um maybe not that big of a deal but I, you do see some acute injuries sometimes. Like, I've seen people who have sprained their toes from, like, forcefully trying to crack oh, them. Yeah. Um, and so there's ligaments there that are trying to protect you, and you're putting, like, a re like a desperate, really uh, strong force through there. You can, you can yeah. hurt the ligaments. I've seen yeah. capsules swell in the toes. Like, toe popping is so common in dancers. And really, like, I just ask dancers, like, Okay, what what purpose? Like, what purpose are you doing that for? Tell me why you think you're doing that. Um, yeah. Most of them are already really mobile in their toes. They don't need more motion. Yeah. It's just something that I think we've addressed already, which it becomes like you want that sound. You've, you've associated it with something good that whether a skilled practitioner gave to you once and you're like, this is good, I'm going to do it all the time. Yeah. Or it's something that you had a short-term relief from yourself and you're like, I want to get that every time. Yep. So, the last thing I want to talk on, and then we'll finish up here. you have a few more minutes? Sure. Okay, because then you asked, you said the question, I'd ask them why. Why do you do that? And so I get this a lot, um, where I, I ask why, I say that's like the most important question you should ask. It's about training. I say, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Um, and I think one answer I get a lot um, is because I need to get back in alignment. And I know this is a, a, a deep conversation yeah. um but i'm hoping we can dive into it just a little bit so if someone says i need to crack because i'm out of alignment I, either what are your response to that what are your thoughts about that right um i don't generally use that term unless we're talking specifically about like your knees over your toes, you know, some specific yeah. ballet alignment. Like, I don't talk about alignment in the sense of our joints. That's a, an antiquated term that I think historically chiropractic has used. Like, there must be something out of alignment. And it's just not evidence-based, and we don't be shy away from using that. Although I know yeah. pe patients come to us, and they've been trained that way, you know, sometimes to think, like, oh, I'm out of alignment. I just need to be back in alignment. And, um... I try to re-educate my patients that that's not really a thing. And in the joint sense, you know, like yeah. um, joints move. Um, they're pretty they're pretty fluid that way. Like there is no perfect alignment for at any given point in time. We can affect motion in the joints. Um, we can change postural habits. We can change positioning when we dance. But there isn't, we don't use a term like your bones are out of alignment it's not so, <laughs> yeah, so to sum up some of the things as we move forward here, the, the last wrapping up, we talked about what that cracking actually was at the beginning, which is simply gas bubbles popping. It's not related to a therapeutic, a, a beneficial thing for a patient. So with that said, if we're doing joint manipulations and they're out of alignment in their back and they get that cracking, you're telling me we didn't move them back into a position that they fell out of right we created motion uh, we created yeah. we created motion which is a good thing in, in some cases when you need that but there isn't you know there isn't a dislocation 
of the joints, there yeah. can be a lack of motion, and we can restore the motion, and sometimes there's a popping sound, and the popping sound doesn't mean that much. <laughs> and I, I want to, my, my theory, and we're, we're a little different, I'd love your take on it. I think of two things when we're doing, so to sum up, what we're doing when you get these crackings, whether it's yourself or someone else, we're doing one of two things. One you just touched on, we're either giving it a bit of a, a stretch, actually, like a, like a deep, quick stretch to try to give it more motion, because whether it's a ligament, whether it's just like kind of, I want to say spasticity, but whether it's your control and you've kind of stiffened up there, or it's actually like the joint itself, particularly maybe after injury, things can stiffen up. The other thing we might be doing, one is stretching, or two is we're actually just providing a pain relief. So we're probably, I would say, a lot of the manipulations I do are actually more on that mm -hmm. side, and I do a lot of self mobs, self like deep stretching band and stuff to get like gentle mobs um, going on. Tangent. So the two things I'm saying we can get with these things is one, and tell me if I'm on the right track here. One, we're getting a quick motion to give you a little bit more movement somewhere targeted specific to what your limitation is, or we're giving you a movement that's probably not changing how you move there, but it does give you a pain relief. Yeah. Would I that think, be too? I think, I mean, I think there's some validity to both of those things. Yeah. I think. Okay. And then in both cases, I think we'd both agree, those should not stand by themselves. Right. Because there's probably something that caused you to feel this way that you need that, and, and we should address that, whether it's, whatever we're doing. There's so many different tools, like you mentioned, and we all, every practitioner will have different tools we use to maybe get similar effects. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, if anyone has any last minute questions, um, I think we've, we've gone through a lot. We've talked self, Carrie's giving you the hard stop. All of you stop cracking, um, <laughs> which now, did you ever crack your joints? Yeah. Is this, uh, yeah, I did. Uh, when I danced, I did. Um, and I ended up in that boat of like, I was in a world of hurt um, and it was not good. And it wasn't until I really realized I needed to strengthen and stabilize that I got better. I'm going to try because this has been a new thing for me with the, I'm just telling because when they feel stiff, try to go to a gentle stretch. Most of this is because I think you're seeing people way more frequent than I am with a lot of my stuff being remote mm -hmm. that I'll kind of give them, hey, try this first, come back to me. Uh, but now you're saying if you feel like you need to pop somewhere, I mean, you feel like you need to crack your hip or your back, you should try to use the muscles around there. So try to do an exercise that works that area first. Yeah. Because they're, see if that, because they're, I mean, they're, they tend to be hypermobile in that area. Yeah. If they're, if they're moving that same joint repetitively, they have a lot of motion, um, and they need, they need support there. So, um, they may, again, they may get a temporary relief from stretching and the, the sensation may go away, but yeah. to get to why they're doing it, they're doing it because they're craving strength and stability. Yeah. Oh man, that could be a whole nother topic is kind of then moving into stability of things, but, um, great. Kristen, thanks for watching. Um, Carrie, thank you. This has oh, been thanks. fun. I think it's been interesting hearing your take. I think you, um, obviously are great. I, I've worked with patients who've worked with you who have nothing but great things to say about you. So you're, you're an awesome asset to the whole dance community. Um, any closing notes on this topic, anything we maybe didn't cover that you wanted to share? We did a pretty so. good job. I think we covered a lot. That was good. Thanks for All having right. me, Scott. Thank you. Um, this will be coming live in a couple of days and we'll be able to share it then. Um, and until next time guys, we'll awesome. see you later. I guess. Have a good night, Carrie. Thanks. You too.